a new one in our midst being dedicated to God. So would you join me now as we pray? Mighty God, by your love we are given children through the miracle of birth. We give you thanks. May we greet each new son and daughter with joy and surround them all with faith so they may know who you are and want to be your disciples. Never let us neglect children, but help us to delight in them, showing them the welcome you have shown us all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In presenting Gary Alexander Schultz to the Lord, do you promise independence upon God's grace and with the help of the church to teach your child the gifts and claims of faith and by prayer, word, and example to bring him up in the nurture, discipline, and instruction of the Lord? Sisters and brothers of this household of faith, I commend to you this family. Your love, care, and example are as necessary to this covenant as their faithfulness in keeping their promise. Will you do all in your power to make this church a true spiritual home for them, giving them the support of your prayers and your example?
God of grace, parent of us all. We pray for these parents and all parents. Help Brandon and Bryce to know you and to love with your love, to teach your truth and to tell the story of faith to their child so that your word may be heard and done. Bless Alex, guard him safely through injury and illness so that he may live the promises you give. And keep us, with this child and with all children, ready to listen and to love, even as in Jesus Christ you have loved us, your grown-up children. In his name we pray. <coughs>
sign up on the PPAS or you can um, send me an email. That will help me be prepared to begin those congregational conversations in a couple of weeks. I'm going to close us in prayer as we begin our worship time together. When we're done, if you'll go ahead and pass those PPAS down the aisle. Dear God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together in your house for worship today. Help us to set aside the distractions of life during this sacred time together so that we can focus on all that you would have us to hear. I pray that we will all leave this place having our hearts tugged on so that we can be a beacon of life for you. In your name we pray. Amen.
faith. Father, we just thank you because in that we are so blessed. And we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come to this place today and to simply worship you, to sing your praises, and just come to this place and love you. And Father, a part of that worship is now as we bring our tithes and offerings. And as we do so, Father, I pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings, that you would use them to spread the word of your incredible love for us throughout this community and in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
sharing your truth, shining the light of your love and faithfulness in all that we do. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> In the beauty of worship, we have been saying our prayers. We have been singing our praises. We have been offering words to God. Now, let's see what the Bible might teach us about how we can pray. How we can pray for one another during these days. There's a great passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter 1 beginning with verse 15, and you will notice it's a passage about prayer. I invite you to listen as I read these words. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, I bought a new gas grill. This one was a little different from any that I ever had owned. This gas grill was fueled by natural gas, not a propane tank. It meant I wouldn't run out of gas when I was in the middle of cooking and the guests were arriving. And you're, that ever happened to you or was that just me? We didn't have natural gas run to our house, but we wanted it for some other appliances. And so we had some natural gas lines run. We had several uh, installations made. We had a stub out for a gas grill. It gave me an opportunity to get a new toy. I was excited about this. You all do know about that. Some of you. And I was all set to go to some high powered grilling when I realized I was in trouble. You see, the stub out that I had, the little pipe that comes out, was three quarter inch. And the hose on my gas grill was three eighths inch. They didn't connect. I had all of this power from natural gas, limitless. And I had the best grill I've ever owned. But without that connection, I couldn't cook one little hamburger. So, I, uh, I went down to my Ace Hardware, actually. Yes. Do I get an amen? No. <laughs> and tried to find the, the right kind of connection, you 
know, surely there's a way these things can get connected up. And I just couldn't find it. I, I, I just couldn't. Now, I have to admit, I'm not much of a handyman. You learned last week I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a handyman. Some of you are now wondering, why did we get this guy to come help us? <laughs> I like what my preacher friend, the late Bill Self, used to say. These hands were made for preaching. <laughs> so my wife knew my pitiful situation when I came back and said, I, I don't know how to do it. She got a man from the church. He went to the same Ace Hardware. He found it right away. He came back. He got me all hooked up. And now the grill was on fire. The, all of that natural gas was flowing. The grilling was great. <laughs> but you had to have the connection. Without it, all of the power and all of the flame <clears throat> wouldn't happen without the connection. In our life of faith, prayer is how we make that connection to God. You see, we have the unlimited power and majesty of God, far greater than any natural gas resources. We have the opportunity for abundant life through Jesus Christ, but until we have made that connection between our lives and this power of God, until that connection is made, our lives are not on fire with this power of God. So today, let's talk about that connection. Let's talk about praying and what we actually could be praying about and praying for in these very days. Now throughout this year, you will have certain encouragements made to you. Would you pray for your pastor's search committee? <coughs> Every church is going through an interim season. That's, that's done. Pray for your pastor's search committee as they do their work. Pray for prospective pastors who might be considering and, and having conversations with this search committee. Pray for your church during this interim time. This morning, we have young Gary here and his parents. Pray for them. Commitments have been made. Let's pray for them. In these days where life has gotten hard, I think, for most of us, we need to be praying for one another. Not just for health during times of disease, but praying for one another in all sorts of ways. So, if we're going to pray for one another, how do we do that? You see, we often just say, well, pray for me, or pray for the search committee, or pray for the church, and we stop there. Thankfully, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is, is actually talking about his prayers, his prayers for the church. And I think he gives us some great guidance about how we can pray for one another, for a search committee, for a young family, for a prospective pastor. I hope you'll pray these prayers for me and for the people on your pew and the people in your Sunday school class as we say our prayers together. As I thought about the pastor search committee and their work and praying for them, I I thought back to other times that I have talked to pastor search committees. There was the time I was going to meet with the search committee from the First Baptist Church in Huntsville, Alabama, where I ended up. We lived there 12 years, and I was pastor there during that time. But this was the first time we were to meet with the committee, the full committee. They said to me, to start off this meeting, would you lead us in a devotion? What do you say at a time like that? When, when that is the opening opportunity, the first word that you have to say, what, where do you go? And I remembered that I turned to this very passage from Ephesians 1, 
15 and following, and I said to the group, let's see what Paul is teaching us about how we pray for one another, and let's covenant to do this. I'll pray these things for you, you pray them for me, who knows how the conversations will go along the way, but we can at least pray in this direction. Maybe that's a good way for us to move in these next few months, praying this prayer. Philip Brooks was a great pastor from another day. You may know he, he's the one who wrote a little town of Bethlehem. So we, we sing him every Christmas season. But he said, pray the largest prayers. You cannot think a prayer so large that God in answering it will not wish you have made it much larger. Pray not for crutches, but for wings. So how do we pray like that? Well, let's look at the scripture. Before we ever talk about the specific petition of prayer, let's back up a little bit. Because Paul teaches us that a prelude, the thing that comes first, a prelude to prayer is listening to people. Verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. This great passage on prayer starts by Paul saying, I've been listening. I've been hearing, and here's what I've heard. I've heard about your great faith. I've heard about your love for God, and that leads me into prayer. Our prayers should start with our ears, not with our mouths. Our prayers should start with our ears, not with our mouths. And you might say, oh, I get that. We ought to be listening to God. Absolutely. We ought to be listening for what God might say to us in prayer. But let's also start by listening to one another. And by hearing the needs and the concerns, the hopes and the joys, the fears, the doubts of one another. Maybe we don't pray so well because we don't listen. Maybe our world has become so uh, infatuated with just me getting my point across that I'm not listening to you and what you're trying to say. Maybe I'm just trying to respond to you instead of understand you. And that's so much of how listening works. What if we could improve our prayer lives by changing the way we listen to one another? And that kind of listening could become the prelude for our prayer. So this week, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you're with friends or family, what are you hearing as you listen and have conversations? What are you hearing that's going well in the life of someone you care about? Make it know. What do you hear that is challenging someone and stretching someone? Listen to that. Make a note of that. It seems like Paul, before he ever said, this is what I'm praying for, he started by saying, this is what I'm hearing. Praying starts not with our mouths, with our ears. Listen. Well, if that's a prelude to prayer, then... <coughs> And he moves right on to say that, that the mood of prayer is thankfulness. Verse 16, very next verse. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he's saying, I'm praying for you. But he's saying the way that I'm praying for you is out of thankfulness. <coughs> Now, what if every day you tried to think and almost 
almost make a list of, of gratitude, of things you're thankful for. Nowadays, it is easy to find things we're upset about. Y'all upset about it? <laughs> That's easy. And, and sometimes we just dwell on that, don't we? We find those things we're upset about, and then we get madder and madder, and we write about it, and, you know, okay. What if every day we looked at, now what am I thankful for? Here is Paul who's seeing this church, and he's saying, I've heard, and as I've heard about you, I'm thankful, giving thanks for you. I have not stopped giving thanks. It seems like when thanksgiving and gratitude becomes the mood in which we live our lives and in which we pray, it gets much harder to stay angry at people and to hold a grudge against people and to be bitter at people and to be judgmental against them if we will be thankful for it. What Paul said. I've heard, and I've never stopped giving thanks. You might say, well, you don't know the people I know. Okay. It's all in how you look at it, isn't it? It really is. I don't know if you've heard this piece it's called I'm Thankful For. I don't know where I found it or who wrote it. But it says what I'm trying to say. I'm thankful for the mess clean up after a party because it means I've been surrounded by friends. I'm thankful for the taxes I pay. Hang on. <laughs> because it means I'm employed. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. For my shadow who watches me work because it means I'm out in the sunshine. A lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing, because it means I have a home. All the complaining I hear about our government, because it means I have the freedom of speech. The spot I find at the far end of the parking lot, because it means I have the capacity for walking. My huge heating bill, because warm. The lady behind me in church <laughs> sings off key <laughs> because it means I can hear the piles of laundry and ironing because it means my loved ones are nearby. The weariness and aching muscles at the end of the day because it means I have been productive. The alarm that goes off in the morning because it means I am It's all in how you look at it. And it's all in how you look at the people around you, the people in your Sunday school class and your family who live down the street. And the more we can begin looking for ways of gratitude and thankfulness for everybody, people who are just like us and people who disagree with us, the more we can do that with that mood of thankfulness, then we are prepared to say these prayers Paul teaches us. So he goes on and tells us what he prays for. I found this to be a wonderful outline. It's the kind of thing, you know, you can make notes, you can put it in your prayer journal, in your Bible, beside your bed, wherever you do your praying, wherever that connection point needs to happen. Because in verse 17, Paul writes, I keep asking, so he's saying, here's what I'm asking, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you, pay attention, because he's saying, here's my prayer list. Now we're usually pretty good about praying for those who are sick, praying for those who are grieving, and, and that tends to be how we think of a prayer list. What if you thought about everyone you know and 
day by day you move through offering thanks for them and then praying and their five things. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you first wisdom to know God. Here's how he says it. They give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. But if we pray for one another in Sunday school classes, in deacons meetings, and up and down the pews, what if we prayed that you would have the wisdom to know God better? Wow, do you think that would make a difference? The wisdom not praying that you would all of a sudden agree with me or praying that you would finally see the light. What if I prayed that you had the wisdom to know God better and then let God do it? That's the first thing. We pray for wisdom to know God. Second thing, vision to see. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. I love the imagery, the eyes of your heart. It, it's not talking about 2020 vision. It's talking about your heart. The eyes of your heart, the vision to see where God is moving. What a prayer to pray for the pastor search committee. Pray that they have wisdom to know God better. Pray they have vision to see where God is pointing them in terms of a new pastor. Vision. It's not just a search committee. It's in life this week at work. It's in school. Do you need some vision to see when you're trying to navigate how to move forward during these days? All do. Let's help each other and pray for each other that we might have not only wisdom to know God, but vision to see. Third one, hope to serve on in verse 18, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called. That you may live and serve out this calling of being a follower of Jesus Christ and that you may do so with hopefulness. That's one of the things that's in short supply these days. Hopefulness. Isn't it? Just, just look around anywhere. I don't, I don't see a whole lot of people bubbling over with hopefulness. Maybe we need to pray. Pray that one another, we will have this hope in order that you may know the hope which he has called. Fourth, grace to receive the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, Paul says. That's grace to receive. That's at, the, that's at the core of our faith. We are saved by grace through faith. In other words, not a single one of us earns our way into heaven. We don't get there because we're so good. It's like an inheritance that we receive. Something that we didn't do anything to earn, but we receive it. It's gift. It's grace. And just like Hope may be in short supply, but the experience of God's grace is often missing. And so many go through life just burdened by their, their own shortcomings, but not seeing this grace that God is wanting to give through Jesus Christ. Let's pray that people can receive and know and experience this grace. And then the last one, power to save. Power to save, verse 19, and is incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. We talked about that over the last two weeks as Paul, the same author, wrote in 2 Corinthians about this power, this resurrection power. So what if we pray for each other these things? Do you think it would make a 
you ever heard the, the words of the Civil War soldier who said it like this? I ask God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I ask God for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I ask for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I ask for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I, among all men, am most. So, sometimes our praying needs to be open to the answers that God gives. And I think the kind of prayer that the Apostle Paul is teaching us through his own prayerful ministry is a message that says, if we will pray for one another, not just that God will grant our wish list but if we will pray that you, 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 and you might have the wisdom to know God, the vision to see, the hope to serve, the grace to receive, the power to save. Do you think that would make a difference in First Baptist Church? I do. So it's time to say our prayer. Are you connected? Great. God of love, God of grace, God who watches over us and hears our prayers, teach us to pray. We ask you even as the followers of Jesus, ask him the same thing. Help us to pray big prayers. Help us to pray these kind of biblical prayers that made a difference long ago and will make a difference now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is number 60. Be thou my vision. The way that we have that vision to see is when we look through the eyes of Jesus, be thou my vision. So there may be a response that you would have to all of this. Hopefully a response is done in a very personal way. Perhaps it is, okay, I'm going to pray in this direction. I'm going to lean in to pray the same way that Paul prayed. Maybe that's just a commitment. You offer to God as we see. Perhaps you're ready to move your membership into this church family. And you're ready to step forward and tell us about it. Or profess your faith and say, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Whatever decision, I'll be right here at the front to receive you. And I invite you to come as we stand and sing number six. <laughs>
as we leave this place of worship and go into the week that unfolds before us, will you get connected? Will you say your prayers? And will you let these wonderful words of Scripture guide you and lead you as we pray for each other in these days? And as we do, we have a wonderful one who leads us and guides us. And that will be our benediction. Christ, go before you to prepare a way of service. Christ, go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for his glory. Christ, go beside you as leader and guide. Christ, go within you as comfort and stead. Christ, go beneath you to uphold you with everlasting arms. Christ, go 